today I've actually dropped the mycotoxins due to the great last talk that we had. We're just going to talk about endotoxins and we're going to talk about it in the context of what is an endotoxin, how does it um, can antagonize pig production, and also talk a little bit about lean tissue accretion. But mainly going to focus on the role of endotoxin with regard to nutrient transport or actually translocation from the lumen actually into circulation. So as the previous three speakers before the break have alluded to, stress, immune function, or immune challenges, I should say, and inflammation can all have any big impact on pork production or on lean tissue um, accretion. It can affect feed intake, growth rates, as the first speaker before the break alluded to, um, feed conversion is also affected by these stresses, immunological challenges, etc. And then it can have an impact on um, reproduction, well-being and health of pigs and other livestock, mortality, so not just the morbidity but also mortality, and this can also impact actual worker morale and then at the end of the day profitability for producers. And at the end of the day, a lot of us here in this room, what we're trying to do is actually maximise lean growth potential in the pig. The genetics are there, but can we actually capitalise on those genetics to actually have an increased um, lean tissue accretion? So endotoxin, what is endotoxin? So endotoxin is derived from gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli and Salmonella are just two classes. It is um, an incredibly potent stimulator of the immune cascade in all species, all mammalian species and even avian species. It, is active, or it activates receptor-mediated inflammatory responses. In particular, the receptors that we're talking about are going to be toll-like receptors. So these receptors can be based on the, AP, or sorry, on the plasma membrane of cells, but they can also be localised inside the cell on the Golgi apparatus and, and, and other organelles inside the cell, depending on which cell type we're talking about. But once these receptors, these toll-like receptors, toll-like receptor 4 in particular, once it's engaged or actually bound by an endotoxin, it initiates a cascade of events that will lead to the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, a febrile response, and then initiate really that innate immune response. And we'll talk a little bit about it. But what's interesting is that there's tolerance built up in cells with regard to receptor binding within the toxin. So once those receptors are actually bound, they actually can be shedded off the membrane of the cells and actually get a tolerance or a desensitization that can occur. So that's why if you go in and give an immune challenge or an LPS, an endotoxin challenge to a pig or to a bird, and you come back a day or two later and give the same challenge again, you get a reduced response because there's tolerance built up due to sh um, receptor shedding. And most of the endotoxin that we refer to is actually probably coming from the gastrointestinal tract. However, endotoxin can come through the lungs, through bacteria in the lungs. So we can't always forget about the lungs. Most of us here, we're kind of more kind of comfortable or refer more to the enteric environment, but there is some endotoxin activation and actually translocation that can come through the lungs. So endotoxin has an outer leaf, or an outer leaf on the outer membrane. It's mainly composed of a unique glycolipid known as a lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And you'll notice that we're synonymously changing between endotoxin and LPS. So one's really a kind of a purified version, and the other one is really just the, um, just the whole process or the whole kind of molecule that consists of an O antigen, a core, and a lipid A. It is actually the, the rich lipid A region here that is actually the immunogenic component of endotoxins. It's the part that actually is going to bind to the pocket of the toll-like receptor 4 to initiate that. Uh, that um, receptor-mediated immune response. Bacteria con uh, contains about um, 10, or 10 to 20 kilodalton micromolecules of endotoxin. And then these can range in different sizes depending on what glycoproteins or what, how big the antigen or the O antigen actually is. So it can range up to about 1,000 um, kilodaltons. And as I said, purified endotoxin is generally referred to as LPS. And it can come from different bacteria. So when we talk about endotoxin, we, can, we talk about it in the terms of endotoxin units. There's about 10 endotoxin units per about one nanogram of LPS per mil. That's probably the rough equivalent. It can vary from country to country. And then one, uh, I'll say a gram negative bacteria contains about 10 to the minus 15 grams of LPS. So about 10 to the 5 bacteria 
would generally generate, and it's going to be bacteria specific, would generate about one endotoxin unit. And I said, as again, this will vary a little bit. So for most of this talk, we're going to focus more about enteric-derived endotoxin. And then really the gastrointestinal tract is a major source or a vessel that contains a lot of gram-negative bacteria. Not all gram-negative bacteria is going to be pathogenic. So we can have endotoxin that can come from pathogenic and non-pathogenic is really going to be the O-antigen that's really going to determine the pathogenicity of it. And then as the previous speaker before the break talked to us already, really the gastrointestinal tract forms this physical and also a secretory barrier between the lumen where these bacteria and viruses and other microbiota reside and the actual body. One of the key messages I want to highlight, or hopefully you guys will walk away with at the end of this talk, is that endotoxin derived from the gastrointestinal tract can come through two modes of transport into circulation. It is not just all pericellular transport with regard to tight junction remobilization and, and leaky gut, if you want to term it that way, or passive diffusion. Certain bacteria, and also I'll argue endotoxin itself, can actually come in a, um, through a transcellular process, i.e. through the cell, and I'll show you some data that will back this up, in a receptor-mediated process. So in other words, when we talk about leaky gut or intestinal permeability, we can't just think of tight junction proteins when we're talking about endotoxin or bacteria. We also need to also consider transcellular transport routes. So it's not just one or the other. They work hand in hand. And depending on the environmental kind of situation or stress, we may favor one over the other, but it just depends. So one of the key take-home messages I want you to remember is that endotoxin or stuff that can, pathogens that can come out of the gastrointestinal tract aren't just always going through pericellular passive diffusion through tight junctions or compromised tight junctions, adhesion junctions, etc. They can also come through the cell itself and then put into the lymphatic or into portal circulation. A lot of the times that we have pathogenic E. coli and bacteria are going to actually um, kind of hijack natural digestive processes. One of them is just coming through on at least on myocells and cholymicron mediated uptake through fat absorption. So as the previous few speakers before the coffee break have alluded to, a compromised intestine can reduce peak performance and also health. However, I'd like to challenge the previous speakers and also everyone in the audience here that we need to really see that compromised intestinal integrity correlate with a change in peak production or performance. So I'd like to see us trying to relate intestinal health markers, so where we're talking about changes in tight junction proteins, translocation of pathogens, et cetera. How does that correlate to changes in growth rates, appetite, and feed efficiency? Because all those, we always kind of put the two together, but I don't think it always is apples and oranges. I think we, we have um, the two separate processes can go on here. But if we do have a compromised intestinal integrity, and also function, we do have the increased likelihood of increased bacterial permeability and pathogen permeability with regard, regard to mycotoxins and endotoxins. And so the previous speaker before the break talked about tight junctions and talked about barrier function, but the primary function of the gastrointestinal tract is to digest and absorb nutrients in a selective manner. And this is um, to maintain a physical barrier between the between the lumen and also the, um, the body, the circulation. Um, and also, there's separate, uh, this is a separation of tissue space that allow, or that is caused by polarization of, of epithelial cells, and we talked about tight junctions already. So here's just, I won't go into too much detail, but really got our tight junctions up the top of, towards the apical side or the luminal side of our barrier. We've got our adhesion junctions, esmers, and gap junctions. One thing that happens first when a lot of stress or immunological challenges in pigs, we actually see t the claudins, which are the gap sealing tight junction proteins, are the one, some of the first tight junction proteins to actually internalize or translocate. So like what the previous speaker showed with her mycotoxin data, she saw a significant reduction in claudin expression through immunohistochemistry, 
is because claudins are some of the first proteins to be sensed at the tight junction to be internalized, therefore leading to a decrease in this barrier integrity. The other thing that's been shown, and weaning stress is probably the prime example of this, that a stress, particularly weaning stress and inflammation, both direct and indirect, can actually damage the, the actual gastrointestinal tract in these tight junctions and permeability. So I mentioned a couple of minutes ago about transcellular processes. And so I want the audience to realize or to understand and they even examine when they're looking at kind of macromolecule uptake through a non-selective manner into circulation, we need to think about M cell transport of luminal antigens and also transcellular routes where we're talking about clothromediated pits, lipid rafts, phagocytosis and, and macropinocytosis as modes of action to actually bring molecules, particularly pathogens and even E. coli, into circulation or into lymphatic into circulation. Because you've got to remember that a lot of the classical work, and here's an example of some of the early work, some of the, some of the first work that was done with LPS in pigs, that done for, out of the University of Illinois with Doug Wabel in 97, when they ejected some nursery pigs with five micrograms of LPS per kilogram body weight, they did a time course blood sampling, and this is just the fold change from baseline or from the controls. But in the first two hours, they see an increase in TNF alpha, the pro inflammatory cytokine. About four hours later, five hours later, they see an increase in IL 6 and, cort and cortisol. And then it's not until about six to eight hours later, they see an increase in blood urea and nitrogen. And this is the classical response that then also correlates with the increase in fever response that you'll see in the pig within about probably 10, 20 minutes after you give an injection. And the way it works is that LPS will bind to the tolerate receptor. It gets internalized, initiates a cascade of events that leads to the phosphorylation and, and liberation of a repressor element, um, I kappa beta. It allows NF kappa B, which is a major master transcription factor, to translocate to the nucleus, bind to the promoter region of genes to initiate a febrile response and also a pro inflammatory response. So this is what we typically see. But you notice by about six to eight hours, this pig has somewhat resolved this challenge with endotoxin or LPS. And then if you come back in at 24 hours later, you probably get about a 50% reduction in this response if you came in with five micrograms of LPS due to the tolerance aspect that I mentioned earlier. But this is just a one-off situation. In other words, the pig has only seen this once. In the field, in reality, pigs see these these antigens, or sorry, see these um, immunogenic compounds all the time. It's a 24-7 argument here. So what happens if we give animals a repeated dose of endotoxin over a period of time? How does that actually impact growth rates and tissue accretion? So this is some work um, that we did at, well, just last Christmas. But what it is, this is in broilers. This is five-week-old broilers. For eight days, every, every two days, we came in and gave them an injection of endotoxin, or LPS. So every second day, we stepped it up 20%, 30%, 40% to get around the tolerance that we would see if we just came in at the same dose every time. And uh, um, people want more details about this work, I can talk to you afterwards. But really what I want to highlight is average daily gain was reduced over this eight-day period by about 20 grams a day. If we look at lean accretion, and we actually DEXA scan these birds and look at body comp whole body composition, so this is whole body lean in these birds, we reduced that in it by nearly 20 odd grams as well, and also we had an impact on fat accretion and bone accretion just over this eight day period. So if you come in, actually a bird gets a sustained, or say, I wouldn't necessarily say sustained, but a repeated inflammatory challenge every 48 hours, it is antagonizing both bone accretion, fat accretion, and lean accretion, and this also is reflective, in, as of course, in its average daily gain. So that's my only poultry slide for this, and then we'll go back to some pig stuff. So really, in pigs, listen, these is the, I know these are hard to see, uh, see and I apologize, but this is muscle, this is liver, and this is mammalian target of rampamycin. Mammalian target of rampamycin is a protein synthesis or protein initiation um, factor. It's a master factor that initiates protein synthesis. When these pigs were infused with LPS, this is in muscle, you get a significant reduction in the activation, in this case, the phosphorylation of mTOR. However, 
it's differential depending on the tissue. If we look at the liver, we actually see an increase in, um, in activation of this, this protein, this kinase, which then initiates protein synthesis. And so one of the previous speakers talked about acute phase proteins. So when these pigs were infused with endotoxin, we're antagonizing protein synthesis machinery in the muscle, but at the same time, we're upregulating protein synthesis machinery in the liver, and you could also say in the spleen or other immune important organs. And this is probably to help with the synthesis of acute phase proteins and cytokines. And this says the same thing for EIF, which is another mTOR pathway. But the other thing I'd like to say about endotoxin, and I really wish the previous speaker had talked about this with regard to mycotoxins, is the appetite aspect of it. One thing that we see with endotoxin, and this is, a, um, this is not my work, but this is someone else's work, they used an enteroendocrine cell line out of mice, so these are endocrine cells that are located in the enteric environment. But when they treat, the, treat these cells with increasing concentrations of endotoxin or LPS, from 100 nanograms up to 10 micrograms, they get an increase in cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin is important both in digestion, but it's also a potent satiation factor. So what we see here is that these cells in the, these enteric cells are actually detecting endotoxin and then they're secreting a satiety factor as well as a digestibility related hormone to help signal the pancreas to release its contents but it's working on appetite and both endotoxins similar to mycotoxins are actually sensed by bitter taste receptors that line the intestinal epithelium so the t2 receptors that pick up bitter taste are actually sensing endotoxin and that is part of the reason why we can get actually a suppression in feed intake that may sometimes be associated with, with um, endotoxin or even bacterial, gram-negative bacterial colonization or pathogenic bacterial colonization. So really what we're seeing in the pigs, in pigs and also in other species that peripheral tissue catabolism is increased, we inhibit protein synthesis rates with endotoxin, we can get an increase in lipolysis and protein catabolism. However, there's very little data looking at how a endotoxin itself actually contributes to proteolysis and protein turnover actually in pigs. And this is one area that we could actually do a lot better work on. Most of the endotoxin work is actually associated with antagonizing protein synthesis, but not on the protein or not on the proteolysis side of things. And then in human medicine, metabolic um, disease, dysfunction, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis, is all associated with increased circulating concentrations of endotoxin. So when we look at the small intestine, and this is one of the kind of the papers that I've really followed since I started, because one of my interests is how does a enteric challenge or a respiratory challenge alter nutrient transport? This paper here, at, also out of Illinois, looked at breed by LPS interactions. They looked at Yorkshire versus Michans, these pigs were, these were about 100 kilogram pigs, they were injected for, um, with endotoxin or LPS, and then four hours later they were euthanized. Ileal sections were then clamped in modified ussing chambers that was described before. Then they looked at a changes in active glucose transport, transepithelial resistance or TER, and also um, uh, sorry, um, di and tripeptide transport here. The one thing I want to highlight, there is breed differences between endotoxin and inflammatory challenges. So here we can see, this is what we would all expect, that, in, that an LPS challenge in York says a significant reduction in active glucose transport in the ileum of these pigs. However, in Michans, it's the opposite. So just because we see it in one breed of pig, we don't necessarily going to see this, probably the same thing in another. And this is just four hours, so this is during peak. Now there probably is, this is probably all tied into some immunological changes or immunometabolism changes in T cell, B cell function, et cetera, with regard to why glucose is different. But we see an increase in di and tripeptide uptake with LPS. So in other words, the nutrient machinery seems to be intact or is differentially responding, not always in a negative manner with regard to an LPS or an endotoxin inflammatory challenge in pigs. The other thing is that we always talk about inflammatory challenges and stress challenges altering barrier function or integrity. But if you look at this top right panel, this is transepithelial resistance. Now, the easiest way to remember this is that the, the higher the number, 
the more resistant, the better off that intestinal barrier is. There's less sodium flux, both transcellular and pericellular, through this membrane clamped in, in the in icing chambers. But we can see there's absolutely no negative effect of LPS endotoxin at four hours in these pigs on barrier integrity as measured by TER. Now that's not to say there is differences with regard to, to um, macromolecule permeability. This is just electrophysiology. So now I'm just going to quickly talk about some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years and in pigs, and that was really we tried to look at the impact of this in repeated inflammatory challenge. So we did four doses or five doses of endotoxin, stepped it up 20, 30, 40%. And how was it impacting digestibility, both total tract and also AIDs? And then we sampled the pigs for some other work here. But we had our kind of um, immune-stimulated pigs, which are the ISS, ISS plus, and our immune um, or and our saline challenge pigs is ISS minus. But we also did this in the context of pigs selected for residual feed intake or feed efficiency. And so I left the residual feed intake or feed efficiency in it because there's always a question, is a pig that is more kind of feed efficient, at least from a genetic standpoint or from a grams of feed, is there differences with regard to intestinal function digestibility? And so we'll go through some of that data. But so in other words, we've got low RFI, which is our high feed efficient pig, and our high RFI, which is our low feed efficient pig. So first of all, the classical febrile response. And this is just averaging their body temperatures that we collected over the week of that challenge. And we can really see here, if we look at the line effect, this is just LPS versus non-LPS, or the interaction, is that we don't always see a line effect difference. In other words, High, pig, high RFI and low RFI pigs seem to respond in a similar manner, at least with regard to febrile response. But you can clearly see that overall, over this week, that these pigs have an elevated eye temperature and also rectal temperature. We did it both ways because we wanted to see how eye temperature would actually correlate with rectal temperature, and we see similar results, and there is an interaction there. So in other words, our repeated model is inducing a, a kind of a low febrile response over this eight day period or seven day period. If we look at feed intake, and this is just grams of dry matter intake per day between the lines, we do see that because we restrictively fed these pigs that most of them were actually the same except we did have our low, um, our lo high feed efficiency pig or our low RFI immune challenge pig actually had a reduction in actual feed intake. So it was inter or interfering with its feed intake over the period. And then we had no real difference is in um, final body weight due to line or to, due to the LPS challenge, but there was an interaction. So what was going on with apparent ileal digestibility of um, crude protein, organic matter, and also with total tract digestibilities? We see no line effect with regard to AIDs, but the immune stimulation actually decreased our AID values for crude protein and organic matter. And, and there was no interaction here of line by um, LPS challenge or immune stimulation. On the energy standpoint, it's a little bit more complicated, but really the main thing I want you to I want to highlight is really a crude protein was significantly reduced with, a, uh, with total tract digestibilities. So immune stimulation with LPS seems to reduce or antagonize digestibility, which would make sense. And this is not always associated with differences in feed intake. So the other thing we looked at, and some work that we're getting more involved with, is actually trying to understand endogenous losses of proteins. So does an immune challenge actually lead to an increase in mucus production? And then what is the contribution of that to the amino acid balance of the animal? And some of the early work that we did with this project that we conducted a few years ago was looking at both ileal mucin 2 gene abundance and also protein abundance and in mucosal scrapings. And what we can see here is that irrespective of line, if we immune challenge these pigs through an LPS, we get an increase in both the protein and the gene abundance of mucin 2. We haven't looked at other mucins, but this will suggest there's an increased secretion or an increase in endogenous losses potentially occurring in these pigs. And we're actually following this work up in PERS at the moment where we're actually looking at um, how PERS and other viruses are actually impacting endogenous losses of proteins using um, nitrogen-free diets. 
The other thing I'd like to highlight, again, this, this data here similarly suggests, or similar to what the LBM paper suggested, but if we look at ileal TERs, we get a significant increase. Actually, also we see no difference actually due to the challenge or line with trans epithelial resistance. However, we do see active glucose transport going up with regard to our immune stimulation. So these Yorkshire pigs that have been genetically selected for about 10 years or 10 generations seem to follow the same trend as what um, they report, the Illinois authors reported in, in, um, in their Michans. We have increased active glucose transport due, a, due to a sustained inflammatory challenge. And this is also backed up with increases in SGLT1, glucose transport mRNA abundance. And so we talk about endotoxin. Endotoxin has also been highly associated with heat stress. And our group's been actively looking at this for about the last five years under different heat stress models. And this has been this is work that's been in collaboration with um, Dr. Lance Bumgard at Iowa State. But he, Lance and I, we actually were interested in how does heat stress alter intestinal integrity and function in pigs, and then how does that relate to endotoxin? And so if you look at the bottom left panel here, we've got our heat stress pigs. These are 50 kilogram pigs, and this is our conditions that we used. This is just a 24 hour constant heat stress. We see that circulating blood serum endotoxin is significantly increased in heat stress after 24 hours. We see the same thing at 12 hours and also six hours. And we believe this is associated with an increase in permeability of, this is fitzidextrin, which is a 4.4 kilodalton macromolecule that should translocate at very low amounts across the ileum and colon. But we see here that heat stress actually causes a significant increase in small intestine or permeability. And this is also associated with significant decrease in trans epithelial resistance. So under heat stress models, this is just looking at anywhere from two hours up to 24 hours. We've come up with this, um, this kind of diagram here that kind of explains it. Is that heat stress or hypothermia reduces blood flow in the, to the GI tract in pigs. We also have associated reduced feed intake. It can lead to hy increased hypoxia in the gastrointestinal tract and oxidative stress can be associated with that. We have ATP depletion and ion pump alterations that can lead to acidosis. And then we can actually get an increase in the myosin light chain kinase activation and myosin light chain phosphorylation, which then is kind of the active myosin ring that actually contracts a lot of tight junction proteins. This leads to an alteration in actual tight junction protein localization to the plasma membrane. They're more internalized, increases permeability. We also get a bluntening or attenuation of villus height, and that leads to altered morphology. And then there's some appetite stuff associated with that which also contributes to the reduced feed intake. But really endotoxin is antagonizing both nutrient transport in our heat stress models and also antagonizing inf inflammation and overall peak health. But heat stress is one of the main factors that, that actually can lead to increased endotoxin uptake. So for the last few minutes, we have time? Yep, yep, so, okay. So for the last part of the talk, I want to talk about some dietary factors that can actually antagonize endotoxemia and actual endotoxin uptake or translocation. And some of the work that we've been doing over the last five years has actually been associated with dietary oils and dietary fats. And so this is some work that we published um, back in 2013. And I know it's hard to see here, but this line down the bottom with the squares, it, it, uh, um, pigs that were just um, gavage with a saline injection, or sorry, a saline kind of dose. Then we got corn, this is corn oil, vegetable oil, and fish oil, the, the VO, uh, CO, VO, and FO. And we can really see here that um, our corn oil, sorry, our coconut oil, CO, which is the top one here, increases postprandial endotoxin uptake in pigs. So in other words, if we gavage a pig with a corn oil-based diet, we can actually increase circulating concentrations of endotoxin postprandially. And this work is kind of built on a lot of uh, biomedical research that is showing that dietary, uh, that cigarette smoking, high fat consumption actually increases endotoxemia in humans and also in rodents. And then that is then the predisposing factor for acute inflammation and that antagonizes metabolic problems. So we want to see, do we see that in production pigs? 
And so looking at the same diets here, that we actually bled, the, um, bled these pigs uh, and also looked at um, just serum endotoxin. And we can clearly see here a significant increase due to coconut oil, so compared to fish oil and saline, it, with regard to serum endotoxin concentrations after feeding pigs diets for about three weeks that were had about, I think, three to five percent um, oil in them. If we look at endotoxin permeability, so we actually isolated some um, gastrointestinal tracts out of pigs. This is actually, uh, believe it, it was um, ileum. We actually mounted them in modified icing chambers and then looked at endotoxin permeability using a fluorescently tagged endotoxin molecule. And we can see here that compared to the saline control, coconut oil significantly increased paracellular transport, or at least translocation of endotoxin compared to cod liver oil, fish oil, um, and there's no difference actually, oh, sorry, and, and vegetable oil and olive oil. So in other words, this data has really suggested that both in a meal standpoint and also in a um, kind of a long-term feeding study, that feeding different dietary fatty acids or dietary lipids to pigs, we can actually modify the translocation and uptake of, of oil, or sorry, of endotoxin due to the different oils. So what we're trying to figure out is what's actually driving that. And so what we're really interested in because we didn't see any differences in our trans epithelial resistance in some of our studies, we want to look at non pericellular or we want to look at transcellular uptake. So we used a compound called beta methylcyclodextrin, and it's a lipid raft inhibitor. Beta methylcyclodextrin actually depletes cholesterol actually out of the membranes of cells, and then we'll try to antagonize lipid raft mediated uptake. And we can clearly see here by pre treating our um, ileal samples with with beta methylcyclodextrin, we get a significant reduction in our saline control group. We also get a reduction in our corn oil group with regard to endotoxin permeability. So this data would suggest that actually there is some transcellular mode of action that's also contributing to the uptake of endotoxin into the pig. Now listen, again, this is just ex vivo work. But we did not have an impact on trans epithelial resistance. So when we modified the cholesterol component of the plasma membrane, we weren't altering the overall structure of the actual um, electrophysiology of the barrier. Okay, my last couple of slides, there's one other thing I'd like to highlight. One other question that we've been asking ourselves is, if we use a purified LPS or endotoxin molecule, do we get the same effect as if we use whole bacteria or a lysed bacteria? And so one of my graduate students, um, Joshua Light, who just graduated, he designed a study, and this is kind of, it's a, it's a four by four type study here, but we can just look at, probably just look at the controls, control treatment here. But really, we had pig, sorry, we had IPEC J2 cells, and we looked at how they responded after 24 hours of either a purified LPS from E. coli K12, a native kind of lysed K12 bacteria, or actually a whole E. coli K12 and then also there's a purified kind of uh, LPS molecule here as well. How do the different ways we presented the endotoxin actually relate to how these cells secrete IL-8? And as the previous speaker alluded to, the IL-8 is actually one of the major pro-inflammatory cytokines associated with inflammation at the intestinal epithelium. So what we can see here is that when, when, if we just focus on the first bar in each of these clusters, in the control pigs, we see that if we give them a um, a purified LPS, we get a significant increase in IL-8 production, secretion in the apical side. However, if we give them a lysed whole bacteria, we get a, a significant increase again, and it's a, you know, it's a two-fold increase. And we see the same if we give them whole bacteria. So in other words, if these intestinal epithelial monolayers are actually exposed to different bacterial components, we're getting differential responses, but really the whole bacteria or a lysed bacteria because of all the associated proteins associated with the endotoxin molecule, we're actually getting a better inflammatory or immune response in this case. So this would tell us we probably should be looking more at actual live bacteria or lysed bacteria rather than false extracted or filtrated purified LPS because it's going to be more realistic. And so we're kind of moving a lot of our models away from LPS itself and trying to use more lysed or whole bacteria. 
So one thing we also did, and I'll share one data slide on this, but we've been using more radio, uh, sorry, a fluorescently tagged E. coli K12 or an F18 or a salmonella typhimarium. We played it out. We then clamped some intestinal epithelial tissues in between our modified ussing chambers. We then look at serosal or mucosal to serosal translocation of that bacteria, do colony forming units, and then we can actually look at the associated attached bacteria here. So in this model that we're trying to up, uh, get up and running, we can, we can study both adhesion, internalization, and translocation of live bacteria across the intestinal epithelium, where everything's all intact there. I, the other thing I'd like to point out, this is with Salmonella typhimarium, but we do see increased colony forming units between the colon and the ileum. So there is a differential response between the small intestine and the large intestine with regard to translocation. And the main take home message I want, us to, um, want you to highlight from this slide is, again, we use beta-methylcyclodextrin in a high fat or low fat diet. So the raft is beta-methylcyclodextrin. The TLR4 is a TLR4 antagonist. It binds to the TLR4 receptor and inhibits binding of bacteria. But the main point is, is if we look at our inhibitors here, or at least in this one, we can see that pigs that consume a high-fat diet, we can actually reduce transcellular, or at least transcellular translocation of whole bacteria in a receptor-mediated manner. So in other words, it appears to be coming through the cell rather than between the cells. So really, um, for this quick overview of endotoxin, this is a huge area. We could go into a lot more details, and I'm happy to talk to more people after this in more detail about it. But really, endotoxin, and I'll also emphasize gram-negative bacteria and gram-negative bacterial um, components, antagonize livestock growth and health. It's, more, it's also, we've got to consider appetite a part of this not just um, looking at protein synthesis. There's breed differences between, between pigs. We also see pre and post absorptive effects. And so we can't always put everything in the same category. We give an endotoxin or LPS challenge, we're going to see a de decrease in nutrient transport or a decrease in barrier function or integrity. It can be different depending on the species and also the diets. We also need to consider endotoxin versus LP or endotoxin LPS versus gram negative bacteria itself and then I've already talked about the trans versus paracellular uptake into circulation but really there's some work we've done mostly work with dietary fat but there's some prebiotic and probiotic effects that can antagonize endotoxin and gram negative bacteria uptake and this could include phytogenic compounds and also binders but really if we can prevent it from coming into circulation we can then hopefully reduce the antagonizing effects it can have on lean tissue accretion in, in the pig. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank USDA and the pork board, our pork producers and all my students, both um, present and, and former, and my colleagues for this work and help, so thanks.